Oh, Charles, not another celebrity book video. Dajahao, I like, I just, like... Welcome back to my channel, apes. My name's Charles, and I'm a copycat, I'm unoriginal, I'm derivative, and I'm better at being redundant than you are. <laughs> but you know what? I love a damn theme. And these little celebrity book videos, they do it for me. They just do. So here I am, beating you senseless with a video concept so used up that even your mom would be jealous. If you were expecting innovation, cutting-edge video concepts, and a deep dive into the psyche of a young, troubled reader, I'm sorry to say you've come to the wrong place. All I have to offer is good looks, hot takes, and humility. The three books I read for this video are supposedly three of Constance Wu's favorite books. If you don't know who Constance Wu is, um... She's in Crazy Rich Asians. Great movie, highly recommend, really good. She also recently came out with a memoir. Maybe we'll chat about that in the wrap up of this video. I say supposedly her favorite books because I found the list on what looks to be some AI generated Ponzi scheme of a website, but what can you do? Which I'll link below for your viewing pleasure anyway. I might keep doing these celebrity book videos, but just assign their favorite books to be books I own and want to read instead of books they recommend, which isn't far from what I'm doing now anyway, because I own most of the books celebrities recommend. So these videos are a cool, hot and sexy way of eating my way through my unread bookshelf and taking you guys along for the ride. I like to do three books for these videos. The websites that list celebrities, it's like a whole, I don't, I don't know what these websites are. It's like, um, what's the word? It's like an aggregation of, it's like group data, aggregate. But the website just lists a ton of different books that each celebrity has recommended over the time, over the time, over like, whenever. And I like to pick three books. Three because I would probably glitch if I did any fewer or any more. Three is just that bitch, you know? Anyway, so I choose three and like I said, I usually already have at least two of the books because they're like popular books that the celebrities have probably never read anyway. So their PR rep has to scour Pulitzer Prize winning lists or like the New York Times bestsellers and be like, Here's some books that fit your image. So the books are usually pretty well known and I want to read a lot of them anyway. It's funny, I actually started making this video, like reading Constance Wu's favorite books six months ago, like in December of 2022. And then I scrapped the footage. I told myself, Charles, you need to be clever. You need to be cutting edge. But at that point, the point of scrapping the footage I'd made, I'd already read two of the books for this video. And I recently got over my delusions of self-importance and grandeur. No big deal. I thought, what makes me above putting on some overalls, rolling up my sleeves, and milking an anorexic cow of a video concept? The answer, of course, being absolutely nothing. And here we are. The three books I read for this video, which Constance Wu lists among her favorites, are Commonwealth by Ann Patchett, The Great Believers by Rebecca Mackay. I've already talked about this book on my channel in two videos. It's one of my favorite books of all time, no big deal. But I did read it for this video. I had bought it years ago over the pandemic and I saw that it was on Constance Wu's list and I was like, why don't I read Constance Wu's favorite books and eat through my TBR? I love reading. I love a theme. Anyway, the last book I read is Five Tuesdays in Winter by Lily King. We're just gonna talk about these books one by one, and maybe at the end of this video I'll have to say something about Constance Wu, because she's like, the supposed point of this video. Let's get into the books. Commonwealth. Ann Patchett, you've done it again. You blew me away. No, that was a prank. This book was horrendous. This book was 
awful. It was so, so bad. This book sucked. If it wasn't for YouTube and fanning the flames of my newfound fame, I probably would have stopped reading for two months because if you didn't know, if you're not here for my viral smash hit favorites of all time video, Ann Patchett's The Dutch House is one of my favorite books of all time, hence its appearance in the video. But it's so good. It's very, very, very good. And I love it. And I remember liking her writing, which is why it was a shock that I hated this book so much. I read two pages and on the first page I knew I didn't like the book and on the second page I knew I would hate the book in its entirety. But because it was Ann Patchett, I was like, I'll read the book. I'll give her a chance. I read to page 47, or rather I read 10 pages and then got the audiobook from my library and listened to 30 minutes of it on two and a half times speed to make sure that I would hate the rest of the book before setting it down. And I hated this book for how it was written. I think I've gotten to the point where I can't get through a poorly written book. The writing can't be cringy. I can't be pissed off. I remember, I remember, it was like I read this book like two days ago or 47 pages of it and I had a headache after I finished the like 1.1 chapters of it. It was so bad and I've recently been really trying not to finish books. <laughs> no, to not finish books that I'm not enjoying. Plowing through a book you don't like and know that you won't like the rest of can put such a dampener on your desire to read and pick up new books and talk about books and just do like anything book related. Also, obviously, I read more when I'm reading books I like. In the past, Whenever I've gotten to a slow book, I kind of just set it down and stop reading for a while, or at least the book itself. In the past, also in the past, I usually read between two and four books at one time. I'm a huge mood reader, and also reading slower books, like I, I just can't plow through a book I don't love really, or that irritates me, so I like to microdose it. That's why I read two to four books. Like I usually have a bedtime story read, an intellectual read, and then I have like just like a pretty generic fiction, maybe like an essay collection or another fiction book. But I love mood reading. I mean, I haven't been doing it recently because I've been doing a lot of reading for videos, but I do overlap my reading. Like I'm, I'm reading books right now for videos that will come out in like a week and then another week. So I'm still mood reading a bit, but that's all to say that bad books really, really put a dampener on your reading habits, which is why I read multiple books at once. I'm really trying not to finish books I don't like. It's freaky to me that this book was published in 2016 originally. And The Dutch House, the book by Ann Patchett that I love, was published only three years later. I don't know how her writing style changes so much over the course of three years. I'm sure her writing style hasn't changed that much. My theory is that The Dutch House considers a lot more serious topics maybe and lends itself to a more serious tone better. I don't know, maybe maybe Ann Patchett just like stripped back a lot of the humor for The Dutch House. Her writing is very unadorned and I like that. I don't like a smart writer. I don't like a writer who thinks they're smart and wants to prove to you that they're smart. I like a good well-written story and that can be written with like very simple words and simple sentence structures which is like I said why part of the reason I love The Dutch House. The writing style is like I mean, it's similar, but I hate how it's executed in this. Patchett tries to be funny and like you can, I don't know, it really didn't hit for me. I hated this book. It made me cringe. It made me annoyed and upset and angry. It feels like, it feels like a novel. Like you told an artificial intelligence bot to write a novel about humanity that's wryly humorous. And this is what it spit out. The first book I read by Ann Patchett was The Dutch House, and then I read a collection of essays. It's called These Precious Days, and I enjoyed that decently, but it, it kind of gave me a bit too much insight into, what's that saying? About how the sausage gets made. What is it? Don't meet your heroes. I don't want to know about an artist. I want to consume and digest and interpret the product separate from the artist, and reading These Precious Days, which is essays about Ann Patchett, it, I think was pushing it a little too far. I don't want to know about an artist. It can really kind of just turn me off of the artwork. 
for example, Katy Perry. I think Teenage Dream, the album, not hot take at all. I think it's a fantastic album, obviously. It's like the only other album to have five number one singles, like after Michael Jackson or something like that, but it has some bangers on it, but I hate Katy Perry's personality. She's so annoying. Sorry, Katy, if you're watching this. And I just kind of cringe every time I listen to a lot of the music thinking about how annoying her personality is. That effect came into play here. And Patchett is very wealthy. Her husband or ex-husband, I don't know how many, uh, husbands she's had but her husband's very rich he like flies planes he owns them she's just like a very rich like almost i don't know oh. um she just rubs me the wrong way a bit like rich older white lady who's out of touch and like pretty intelligent but privileged hasn't like faced a lot of challenges which is like false after reading these precious days, but that tone really comes through in this book and I hate it. Like you can tell that it's this like rich white woman who's trying to write a novel, just like a book. And it's very aggravating. Let me, let me read you some quotes to try and better explain what pissed me off. So I'll stop ranting about whatever. I don't know, it's just like, she's, she's trying too hard. She's trying to be funny and she's trying to be simple. I said that earlier I hate authors who are like, I'm smart and like wanna prove it to you. I also hate authors who are like, look at how simple my writing is. And then like wanna beat you over the head with how like, how simple and refreshing it is. And like Riley funny. It's like this book isn't funny. Cormac McCarthy does that. I hate Cormac McCarthy. He, he, he does the whole like, look at how simple I can be and brilliant. And it's very aggravating. I could never fall into this story because of these qualities of the writing. I'm fine with a boring story. It just has to be well written. I can't do the whole exciting plot and poor writing. That's why I'm like not a TikTok babe because I just can't, I can't get into those novels even if I try. I don't think I could be like a Colleen Hoover stan. I respect the hustle, don't get me wrong. It just couldn't be me, I don't think. The first line of this book is, the christening party took a turn when Albert Cousins arrived with gin. It, and it's supposed to be like, uh, oh, we all know what that means. Alcohol at a christening party, oh no. Like Riley funny, and it's just, let me read you some more. Um, 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 um. I'm just gonna do a little rapid fire of quotes that really pissed me off. I, I don't like the style. Fix hadn't checked his watch when they'd left for the market, but he was a good judge of time. Most cops were. They'd been gone 20 minutes, 25 tops. Tom didn't notice the difference, but then a fireman wouldn't. If the place didn't smell like smoke, then there wasn't a problem. Albert Cousins handed over the bag and Fix looked inside. It was a bottle of gin. A big one. And then there's like in the very first pages, I think a lot of the characters in the books are like cops and lawyers. And there's this like macho talk about lawyers and cops. That was annoying. Oh, here's the like, what I mean by like, rich white lady, privileged, obnoxious. Clearly Beverly had her hands full. To look at her, anyone would think that Beverly was the sort of person who would have her parties catered. Someone who would sit on the couch while other people passed the trays. Oh, oh. I like, I just, like, Beverly's not like other girls. She doesn't get minorities to cater her party. She's a rich white woman who rolls up her sleeves and puts ice in drinks herself. Like, that's... I hate the not like other girls. Ann Patchett's just too old to be doing shit like that. Like, you know better, Ann Patchett. You can't write like that. And then there were a couple things that like actually pissed me off that didn't just like not align with my personal taste. Like I'm sure some single 45 year old woman would be like, this book is a romp. I love this book. Sorry if you love this book, I don't like it. But 
I respect your opinion, um, and I'm glad you like it because I still love Ann Patchett. I'm just feeling a bit disillusioned. Um, here are a couple parts that I actually hated about this book, and then I was like, what is wrong with you? Here's the quote. Beverly's best friend, Wallace, was using the side of the bright chrome toaster to reapply her lipstick. Wallace was too thin and too tan, and when she straightened up, she was wearing too much lipstick. Sorry, what, Ann Patchett? Like, what the hell is wrong with you? I'm tired of the, to get a little feminist here. Like, I'm tired of the whole bashing women because they're too skinny or they're too fat or they tan too much or they wear too much makeup or they don't wear enough makeup. Like, like so what if a woman wants to look like a sexy piece of dolled up kindling? Like, is it your place, Ann Patchett, to put her down for being tan and skinny and liking lipstick? I don't think so. That part aggravated me. I was like, are you... Wallace was too thin. When I was reading this book, I thought it was written in like, I don't know, like early, early 2000s. I thought this was like Ann Patchett backlist, backlist, not like one of her more modern novels. She's written like seven or eight books. And so I was like, oh, I guess she was just out of touch. But this was 2016, like, anyway. I'm getting so worked up over this novel. It, it's just really disillusioning to read a book, say it's one of your favorite books of all time, and that you love the author, in my case being The Dutch House and Anne Patchett, and then you read another book by the author and your head just like spins. You're like, what did I get wrong? I read The Dutch House three years ago now, but I, I don't think that my reading taste or perception has changed so drastically to the point that I call a book by one author one of my favorite books of all time and then another one one of the least favorite books I've ever read I don't know it's really really to be real it is very disheartening like the Dutch house is a great book um I guess a lot of authors get better at their craft over time or they change how they write and Paget must have this makes me wary to buy an author's backlist you know like some authors have been writing for decades and then they have a breakout novel and it's really fantastic and highly praised and I've read a couple of those breakout novels and been like oh I love this author and then I start buying their backlist like Ann Patchett or Lily King but after reading Commonwealth I don't I'm not picking up another Ann Patchett in anytime soon at least. I was super excited for the book this fall but I don't know when or if I'll read that now. But I'm definitely not ordering an author's backlist blindly anymore. I'm not, I'm not gonna keep being disillusioned like this. At one point she calls a cop car a black and white. Like it's just so, the book is so like write a novel and this is what pops out. It's very obnoxious. Oh my God, it kind of reminded me and a lot of people love him. So eat me up in the comments, but it reminded me of Pat Conroy. I don't like Pat Conroy. I read The Prince of Tides. It was like a decent story, but I don't like his writing. I don't like the Oedipal nature of his writing and of, I don't know, just like, it, it feels like his generation. I think he and Ann Patchett are probably around the same age. I think Pat Conroy died. Let me Google that. Pat Conroy. Yeah, he died in 2016. No, he was born in 1945. Okay, Ann Patchett was born like 20 years later, but their writing really reminds me of one another. It's like, kind of simple. They're both kind of annoying and snooty and self-indulgent and oddly prurient. I'm not like a prude by any means. I mean, I love Brett Easton Ellis. You cannot be a prude and read his works, but I hate when authors like write, I don't know, I hate when they get like sexual or weird or Oedipal about just like like, why did you have to do that? Why did you have to do that? I've read Misery by Stephen King and there were like a lot of weird, just like for no reason. I think like similes about masturbation and shit. I was like, what? Like, where did this come from? But Pat Conroy also does that. Like I said, that shit is Oedipal. It is weird. I hate. I hate when characters will like compare their significant other to one of their parents and be like, oh, there's so much like them. And it's like, this book is fiction. Did you have to include that? No, you didn't. It's just uncomfortable. I don't, I don't like it. I'm getting ahead of myself though. I haven't pointed out the second part of Commonwealth that I read and really, really hated. Um, Oh my God, there were like three parts. Ann Patchett in this book comes across as a like 
not like other girls. Like, I'm rich, but I get it. She doesn't get it. At least not in this book. And she's exactly like a category of other women who, claiming to be not like other women, put other women down. That is a very distinct stereotype that she falls into in this book, and it really, really aggravates me. At one point she says, it was a crime what time did to women. Like, like everyone ages. I hate the implication behind that quote. The implication that as you age, you become less beautiful, which is just not true. Like, a lot of people grow into themselves. I think that a lot of older women look, not to be a little milfy, but I think they look better than when they were younger. I think that there is a way to age gracefully and look better than you did when you were young. And I hate, I hate, hate, hate the quote, it was a crime what time did to women. Like everybody ages. I think Sandra Bullock looks fantastic. I think Nicole Kidman looks amazing. I think old women look beautiful. And I hate, I hate to think of an old woman, or just like older, just like not a teenage woman, or man for that matter, I hate to think of them reading that line and it like affirming some self-confidence issue in their appearance. It really makes me upset. If you're old and you're watching this, if you think you're old, if you're actually old, I think you're hot and sexy and I hate Ann Patchett for saying that. Okay. We're gonna touch on another aspect of this book that I hated and then move on so that I'm not spiraling for the entirety of this video. Okay, I'm gonna explain the characters just really quickly so that you understand the quote. Franny is this man's daughter, Beverly is this man's ex-wife, and the him in question is the guy. So Franny's the daughter, Beverly's the ex-wife, and Beverly is Franny's mother. Here's the quote. Truth be told, Franny irritated him. The way she looked like Beverly, but without Beverly's sense of knowing what to do with her looks. Her hair in a ponytail, the drawstring pants, not so much as chapstick on her face. He knew people here. Sometimes his doctor came by during treatment. She could have made an effort. And that was when I had put the book down. That quote is atrocious. It is unacceptable. It's not enjoyable. It's not funny. And what Ann Patchett may have been trying to do is write from the perspective of a guy who criticizes, you know, like men do that, will like criticize their daughters or their wives' appearance and like not trying enough or whatever. Like it's a common stereotype. I don't care what Ann Patchett was doing with it. You can't build a sympathetic narrator. He's not a narrator, but he's like the main character by saying your daughter doesn't look hot and bothered enough for you. Like. The guy has like cancer and he's getting his treatments and he's saying that his daughter doesn't look like a hot, dolled up, busty babe. No, Ann Patchett, I do not want to read about your electric complex ass main character. And then the like comparing <laughs> the daughter to the mother being like, you know, my daughter has all the makings of my hot, sexy wife, but she doesn't try hard enough for me. And I wish she looked hotter so that I could bang her too. Any way you look at it, that quote is horrendous. It's not enjoyable. It's not fun. It's not some scathing critique on men. I don't care. I literally just don't care. Books should be enjoyable or I need to read Lolita so that I can like use that as my touchstone for perverts and pedophiles because Donna Tartt loves that book, and a lot of authors I really, really respect love the book, even though it's controversial. By virtue of it being recommended by so many people I love, I think that it should explore whatever themes a lot better than anyone else who attempts to. Anyway, I hated this book. It reminded me of why I love Russian Lit, or the Russian Lit I have read. That being that a lot of it is the product of authoritarian rule, so there's not as much leeway. 
I don't know, to be whimsical or silly or like write about things that don't carry some sort of intense life gravity to them, if that makes any sense. If you couldn't tell, this book was a major disappointment. I'd been putting off reading more of Ann Patchett because I was worried that I might not like some of her books. I thought at the worst I would just not love them. I never ever ever imagined that I would hate this book. Also you can't take the guy's criticism of his daughter in good faith for Ann Patchett like oh she was criticizing men who criticize women's appearances because earlier on in the novel Ann Patchett is like this woman was too skinny and too tan and she liked makeup too much. Like no, at that point, you've lost all credibility and any further commentary on someone's appearance has to be taken at face value as the author's opinion. The next book is The Great Believers by Rebecca Mackay, and this book has funny parallels to Commonwealth. I didn't even explain what Commonwealth is about. It's just like a family drama, I think. I would not recommend anyone read this book. Read The Dutch House. I really love that book. I'm gonna stand by my opinions. I still love The Dutch House. I still like Ann Patchett, but I really didn't like this book. I think I was saying that um, The Great Believers has a lot of funny parallels with Commonwealth, which is why I put them back to back so that I could lead with the fact that they have a lot of funny parallels. That being that The Great Believers is one of my favorite books of all time. And after reading this, I saw that Rebecca Mackay was releasing a new book. I think it came out in February of this year and I was thrilled to read it. I picked it up and it was one of the worst books I've ever read. Poorly written, performatively liberal, boring. It was a murder mystery, insufferable, protagonist. Just an awful book all around. But I love The Great Believers and it's one of my favorite books of all time. Similar experience with Commonwealth. I read The Dutch House, loved it. Commonwealth is one of my least favorite books I've ever read. Also, The Great Believers was, as you can see at the top, a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. There are usually only two finalists and one winner. This year there were two winners, which is very unusual, but The Dutch House was also a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in fiction. Yeah, like very similar parallels. I've talked a lot about this video on my channel. It was in my top reads of 2022. It's also in my favorites of all time video. So I'm going to try and touch on it a bit more in this video. I don't know if I will have edited it out, but I did read this book originally for this video, which I decided not to put out. And here I am filming. It's about the AIDS crisis of the 1980s. It's a dual timeline where you follow guys in the 80s and it switches between that timeline and 2015, which when this was published, it was like the present timeline and it follows the sister of one of the AIDS patients who dies and that's the opening scene of the novel so it's not a spoiler and you just kind of like follow the group of guys and in 2015 you follow the girl whose daughter she's not missing but she's like doesn't want to see her mom and is avoiding her and her mom is searching for her the writing is good it's not cutting prose by any means it's not Joan Didion it's not Philip Roth it's also not Donna Tartt level storytelling or writing but it's good it's good writing I love this book because it's a good story and it makes me sad and you can't ask for much more in a book. I didn't really like the 2015 timeline at all and by virtue of the novel being like a dual timeline that means it's like half in the 80s and half in the 2015 timeline which I did not enjoy. I thought Fiona the woman it follows the sister who is at that point grown up obviously 80s to 2015. I thought she was kind of annoying. I didn't like her angst. I thought most of the characters in the 2015 timeline line were pretty annoying. It's funny, when I was reading I Have Some Questions For You, which is Rebecca Mackay's most recent book, which I hate, the protagonist of that really reminded me of Fiona in The Great Believers, but like pushed to the max, pushed to the abject. She's awful. And I Have Some Questions For You. Fiona in The Great Believers is just like mildly annoying. In the 1980s timeline when she's a girl, I really like her character. It doesn't feel like the same person 40 years later. I didn't really care about the 2015 timeline at all. I didn't care about Fiona finding her daughter who didn't want to see her. The 2015 timeline was only really effective insofar as it added that tone of inescapable tragedy to the 80s timeline, which is to say Mackay maybe should have just started with a prologue set in the present and then just focused on the 80s timeline. Because I thought the 2015 timeline wasn't effective and like boring, it felt kind of performatively creative, like what could I do to make this novel like? a bit more intellectual. 
oh, maybe do a dual timeline. But I don't know. I'm just giving this book a hard time at this point. I love it. Like I said, it's one of my favorite books of all time. When I made my 2022 favorite books of the year, it was my top read. I think when I did my favorite books of all time, it was surpassed by Writers and Lovers, which I didn't realize I'd read during the same year. But yeah, I, I really do love this book. It, this is just me being nitpicky because in the previous videos, I've just been like, I love this book. You should read this book. Um, um, so I'm trying to give you a little bit more. It should say a lot that I have like fairly substantial critiques of the book, but still love it as much as I do. It's really sad. It's a great story. I recommend you read it. Like I said, I love, love, love the 80s timeline. I love Yale, the main character. His storyline follows his relationship with his boyfriend, Charlie, and you know, like a relationship. There are problems and they face them, whatever, whatever. Yale is very sweet and I love his job. He works as like, I don't know what the right term is, but like an art curator slash art person. He works in the art industry. I think he works at one point at a museum or something, but throughout the novel, he's trying to acquire a collection of paintings from a woman who happens to be Fiona's grandmother, I wanna say, or something like that, great aunt, grandmother, I don't know. But I really enjoyed that timeline and the grandmother, I'm gonna say grandmother even though I don't really remember who it was. But she's very old in the 1980s and people are like, there's no way she has this collection of very famous paintings, sketches, whatever, which would be worth like millions of dollars. And you follow Yale trying to acquire the collection because the woman doesn't wanna give the pieces to her children to sell. And it turns out that she, it, it's not a spoiler, I don't think. But the grandmother has all these sketches that are rare and valuable because she was an art student or like a model in Paris while all of these artists were making art and they did pieces of her and gave pieces of her in payment for modeling. That is not a euphemism for prostitution. Yeah. I, I love the 80s timeline. I loved all aspects of the 80s timeline. I love the characters of the 80s timeline. There were a couple parts in the 2015 timeline that really were effective in kind of just like pulling your heartstrings and giving the 1980s timeline that like sepia toned vintage feel, if you will. The last portion of this book, like, I don't know, like last fifth, last quarter, something like that, is excruciating. It's dreadful in an inexorable, perfectly suspenseful heartbreaking way. It's really good. I really recommend this book. And you feel like accomplished for reading such a thick book, which is always a nice feeling. It's very readable and it has a good flop. This is a nice book. The last book I read for this video is Five Tuesdays in Winter by Lily King. This is a short story collection. There are 10 stories and they're all very short. Uh, you can see how short the pages are, fairly decent spacing and margins. I think I read this in a day, which probably contributes to my opinion that overall this collection is very unremarkable. The writing is fine. I enjoyed a few of the stories, including the first one, but they really didn't do anything for me. It was just like eating a piece of white untoasted bread. Like, okay, cool, I guess. I did that. They didn't alter me like her novels did. I love Lily King. I love Writers and Lovers and I love Euphoria. And I plan to read the rest of her backlist. Although after Anne Patchett, I'm very scared that I'll hate one of her older novels and that'll radically alter my perception on her modern and upcoming work. I'm still gonna give it a shot. I really do love Lily King. I think of all of, of like Rebecca Mackay, Anne Patchett and Lily King, I like Lily King's writing the most. I just didn't think about these stories at all after I finished them. A couple of the stories were boring. One or two were kind of cringy. There was a story called Waiting for Charlie, and I think it was about some like extremely injured boy, and it felt really jerky and abrupt, like a lot of the stories, but that one in particular. Most of these felt less like short stories and more like the seeds of novels that never got written. You can call me a short story hater, but these stories just weren't it. I will admit though, I do struggle with the merit of short stories or like seeing them as their own distinct unit within storytelling. You know what I'm saying? Like I think a lot of short stories are just like novels that didn't get written or just kind of like writing-y exercises. I struggle to see them 
I struggle to see them. With the exception being Edgar Allan Poe, those stories work for me. I love his short stories, and I think that they should be short stories and not novels. The short story format allows for their whimsical and eerie nature to remain novel, to remain novel. <laughs> Get it? Ah. Uh... <laughs> But to remain novel, ha ha, that wasn't intentional, ha ha. To remain original and surprising and not become eye-rollingly exhausting and overwrought. But I don't think I've ever read another short story collection or just individual short story and been like, oh, I get it, now I get it. I've been meaning to read some of Tolstoy's short stories. Maybe those will change my mind. I love Anna Karenina and I love Tolstoy's writings. I do love a good essay though. I've read a couple David Foster Wallace essays and he's brilliant. Brilliant. Drop a short story collection or an essay collection in the comments. I'll give you a dollar. If you love Lily King and short stories are your thing, feel free to give this book a shot. It's not like you'll be wasting too much time if you don't end up enjoying it because it is very short. And like I said, I did enjoy a couple of the stories, but under no circumstances should you read this book if you haven't read both Writers and Lovers and Euphoria. Those are two of my favorite books of all time. I, I think I forgot to put Euphoria in in my favorite books of all time. I don't think I talk talked about it in the video, but I probably think about that novel more than I think about Writers and Lovers. I just think Writers and Lovers is overall the better book, but oftentimes you have flawed like uh, books that really speak to you, you know? That's one of them for me. Not that the book is flawed, I don't know. Euphoria is fantastic. I think about the concept the book is centered around all the time. I thought about it before I read the book, but having someone define it and like write a novel which centers around that idea and explores it, <laughs> was kind of pivotal for me, but it, it was really good. So read Euphoria and read Writers and Lovers and pick up Five Tuesdays in Winter after that if you feel like it. Oh, if anyone has read Lily King's older books, like The English Teacher, or I think there's one about a daughter, I don't know. Let me know what you thought, especially if you've read the two books I have, how they compare. I, I, I'm ex still excited to read her backlist. I think when Lily comes out with a new book, I like might actually piss myself. I'm so excited for more work from her. Also speaking of old women, Ann Patchett, look at how like she looks gorgeous. Like don't tell me about old women being ugly Ann Patchett. Have you seen Lily King? Maybe you didn't age gracefully, but other women can. I love Lily King's writing. These stories were just unremarkable. Oh my God, Ann Patchett reviewed this book. I had forgotten about that. When I picked this up, I was like, oh wow, Ann Patchett loves this, so I will. Ann Patchett said, five Tuesdays in winter moved me, inspired me, thrilled me. It filled up every chamber of my heart. I love this book. Good for you, Ann Patchett. Can't relate. The New York Times book review says, King writes stories to curl up in. They afford us something rarely celebrated in literature comfort. I really agree with that assessment of Lily King's writing. It, it is such an undervalued quality comfort in books. Her books are very comforting to me, like Writers and Lovers and Euphoria, despite being to various extent sad. They are very comforting and well-written, and I don't think we celebrate that enough in at least like literary fiction, whatever that means. Like when you think comfort, you think like poorly written, whatever novels. But Lily King is great at comfort and doing comfort cleverly and sexily. I had a fine time reading these. There are just so, so many other books that you should read before this, including her like actual novels that I, I would never recommend this or I would recommend it to like very, very few people. If you've read this, tell me your favorite short story. That's it for this video. Those were the three books I read. It's funny because I read The Great Believers in December, and then I read Five Tuesdays in Winter, like the very beginning of January, and then I read 47 pages of Commonwealth, or rather, I read 10 pages, and then read along while I listened to 37 more pages on 2.5 times speed audiobook. So I actually did like 30 minutes of reading for this video, but... What can you do? Oh yeah, this video is about Constance Wu. Like I said, I love Constance Wu. I think she is fantastic in Crazy Crazy. I think she's fantastic in Crazy Rich Asians. She has a really good list of like favorite books. Let me look at it. No, Constance Wu's recommendations are amazing. Some of these I've read, some I haven't. Middle March, George Eliot, Five Tuesdays in Winter, Consider the Lobster by David Foster Wallace. 
I don't I don't remember that being on this list, but it is. And I've read a few essays from that collection, including the titular one, and it's great. Like I said, he's very clever and very funny. And the prose, the prose, you, that shit is prose, you know, like, Oh, William by Elizabeth Strout, another Pulitzer Prize darling, Elizabeth Strout, Commonwealth, and Patchett, The Great Believers. She also recommends Writers and Lovers by Lily King. I think at that point I'd already read it. She recommends the Neapolitan novels by Elena Ferrante. I love the first one. I'm still look I'm still looking licking. I'm still looking forward to picking up the second one. I'm reading another of her books pretty soon. Keep your eyes peeled. Franny and Zoe. Shut up, I think I just found my next celebrity book video that we're gonna do. Um, oh, if you guys have any, if there are any celebrities you would be interested in me doing, drop a comment down below, don't be coy. Um, Gilead, Marilyn Robinson, another Pulitzer baby, Bad Feminist, Roxane Gay, The Complete Poems by Emily Dickinson. So what I'm hearing is that Constance Wu wishes she were me and she has a, a bootleg version of my taste. Her taste is really good. These are all like very good books. They're about like human Humanity. They're like warm comfort books per se, but like very well executed. C, Lily King, Elena Ferrante, Rebecca Mackay, Ann Patchett. There's a very clear theme. I really hope Constance Wu has read these books. I feel like if any celebrity were to have actually read the books they recommend, it would be her. I, I like really believe this. This is a really cohesive list. Either that or her publicist did a great job of recommending these books and telling her to recommend them. I think that's it for this video. Like, subscribe, let's chat down below in the comments. I think fame suits me. What do you guys think? I'm probably gonna spend the rest of the day taking selfies so I can do a hot thumbnail for this video because I haven't made one yet. Being a famous YouTuber is hard, guys. It's raining right now. Have you guys tried highball energy drinks? They're really good. Do you guys drink energy drinks? Do you drink coffee? Like what is, what's your poison? What, you know, I'm reading Madame Bovary right now and I'm having a pretty good time. I like it. It's probably gonna be in next week's video. Don't tell anyone. Have you read any of these books? What did you think of them? I went to Target today, no big deal. I got this like um, cuticle oil, I think. I don't know, my friend, my nails are pretty botched, like, not in a, like, um, vain way. Like, I, I don't care how my nails look, but they're so botched that I'll just be, like, uh, I don't know, like, touching stuff and they'll start bleeding because of how dry and cracked they are, which is not good because then I get, like, blood everywhere. Um, so my friend was, like, get some cuticle oil and she really likes this one. It says Essie on a roll. <laughs> And so I just put it on my little cuticles. And so far, so far being the like hour that I've had it, I like it. Yeah. That's it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for watching. I cannot believe how the channel is growing. All jokes aside, insane. Um, yeah. I appreciate your love and support. Okay, bye for now. See you soon.